Well, greetings once again, Culture Bugs, for our continued walk through the sign reading. Uh, we're going to take up here at page 159 and continue on to 172. Uh, notice that the um, where we ended before the um, we had that elaborative diacopy for clarity and the um, the anaphora associated with uh, Peter Walsh um, and his sort of uh, singular, uh, you know self-focus by the repetition of his um, this is a um, this is a device that uh, that happens here uh, we don't see very often in wolf and that is they were eating so we get this flash transition to the hotel dining room uh, which eliminates her need to uh, to then again she just doesn't use transitional words you know meanwhile um, you know and the, the sort of thing that you normally see in a narrative I just wanted to point out there the uh, the repetition uh, four times of this phrase uh, for they it's describing the um, uh, the family that um, that Peter Walsh is um, is seated near uh, down in the hotel dining room and um, so we're in the minds of uh, of this family that are presumably tourists for they were not used to so many courses at dinner. Uh, for they had been running about London all day shopping, sightseeing, for they looked round and round, uh, round and up at the nice looking gentleman in the horn room spectacles, that's Peter, um, for they would have been glad to do any little service. So this, this anaphoric phrase, for they, highlights the, the way these visitors to London, these tourists, um, you know, are not used to big city life, and um, they're asking to be sort of excused for not uh, knowing how to act, maybe not even how to uh, feel. Let's see. Um, this is just a great characterization information here at the bottom. Um, he has. This is Peter has exchanged pleasantries with the Morris family, and um, so he says, uh, feeling very well pleased with himself. For the Morrises liked him. Yes, they liked a man who said Bartlett pears. They liked him. He felt uh, again so important for. Uh, for Peter. Then I want to point out here over on page 161, and again just because I'm glossing here doesn't mean that um, uh, you should not be reading at least in some um, in some detail. And and just because I've picked up things doesn't mean that I've picked up everything. So continue to read and, and gain for uh, for yourself a sense of, um, of what's happening with respect to the narrative. But just want you to look at this absolutely marvelous extended metaphor here. And I'll go ahead and, and just read the entire paragraph. Since it was a very hot night and the paper boys went by with placards proclaiming in huge red letters that there was a heat wave, wicker chairs were placed on the hotel steps and there, sipping, smoking, detached, gentlemen sat. Peter Walsh sat there. And here's the beginning of the uh, extended metaphor. One might fancy that day, the London day. Okay, so we have that. Elaborative diacopy here. Was just beginning. Like a woman who had slipped off her print dress and white apron to array herself in blue and pearls, the day changed, put off stuff, took gauze, changed to evening, and with the same sigh of exhilaration that a woman breathes, tumbling petticoats on the floor, it too shed dust, heat, color. The traffic thinned. Motor cars tinkling, darting, succeeded the lumber of vans. And here and there among the thick foliage, sorry, of the squares, an intense light hung. I resigned, the evening seemed to say, as it paled and faded above the battlements and prominences, molded, pointed, of hotel, flat, and block of shops. I fade she was beginning, I disappear, but London would have none of it, and rushed her bayonets into the sky, pinioned her, constrained her to partnership in her revelry. It's just so fantastic, um, because if you, if you notice here, we've got, um, so this would be an example of, okay, the, sorry, that's going to bug me. I resign, I fade, I disappear. So that's a good example of tricolon, 
we've got that parallel structure there uh, again in the in, in the metaphoric mouth of of the evening uh, but London would have none of it would not let uh, so it's it's that that sense of the um, the interminable day in June because as you know you know June is um, uh, toward the end of June you know the 21st or so 22nd is the um, is the summer solstice so it's the longest day of the year then and so we're in that in that zone um, here in our narrative and so it's a sense of, of day uh, lasting quite a long time so uh, like I said it's just a marvelous extended metaphor okay um, here's a nice um, a nice element that we haven't seen very much in the in the narrative really or, or any sort of, of um, works that we have read and it's um, it, it sort of speaks to uh, to pointillism um, which is the uh, impressionist painting technique in which a, um, a painter will put dots of pure color next to each other uh, so let's say that you've got a, um, uh, a red and yellow and, and the eye combines it to make orange and you have it here they would now have two hours at the pictures it sharpened it refined them the yellow blue evening light and on the leaves in the square shone lurid livid they looked as if dipped in seawater the foliage of a submerged city so the the yellow and blue together of course make green and then um, the, the mind is going to put these together in green and it prefigures then the leaves the seawater the foliage isn't that great okay let's see um, uh, again take a look at um, at some of the uh, the narrative techniques not not just narrative techniques so much as uh, as style points that um, uh, that Wolf uses so we're now in the mind um, uh, of Peter Walsh he was astonished by the beauty then of course of the city it was encouraging too for where the returned Anglo Indians sat by rights he knew crowds of them in the Oriental Club biliously summing up the ruin of the world here was he as young as ever uh, so this is an example of anastrophe. Okay, so we talked about anastrophe being the um, the inversion of normal word order. Um, also, uh, hyperbaton. I'll just throw that out there um, is another term that is used uh, often synonymously with uh, with anastrophe. And so it's pointing up Peter's singularity, his otherness. In this case, how unusual he is, or or out of place. Okay, as you as you look at the uh, the inversion of that normal word order okay let's see um, so we're in this uh, as we push on toward the bottom of the page and we are uh, again Peter is um, is thinking back about um, earlier times there at uh, at Borton um, with Clarissa and um, and her family uh, so he references uh, old Miss Perry oh, this would be uh, Clarissa's aunt she would die like some bird in a frost gripping her perch she belonged to a different age but being so entire so complete she would always stand up on the horizon stone white eminent like a lighthouse marking some past stage on this adventurous long long voyage this interminable he felt for a copper to buy a paper and read about Surrey and Yorkshire he had held out that copper millions of times Surrey was all out once more this interminable life so the, the epizuxis and hyperbole combine to prefigure the phrase that punctuates the long sentence, this interminable life. Okay, so again, form following function. Uh, let's see here in the middle of page 163, uh, this paragraph, long paragraph that, uh, that we began uh, earlier. Just look how long that thing is. I mean, it begins here at the bottom of 161 rolls through 162 and then finishes up at 163 and ends with uh, with a sentence that is both anthropophora and ellipsis so the um, uh, the rhetorical question um, and so it's, it's unanswerable and then beauty anyhow the ellipsis that um, um, that then begins the next paragraph and so 
you know, here uh, she uses ellipsis again and, and, and is going to quite often for the rest of the narrative, especially when we get into the, um, the particulars of the party. So the elliptical sentence here, absorbing, mysterious, of infinite richness, richness this life. Now that elliptical sentence suggests the infiniteness Peter observes. Uh, the sense of the sentence conveys what links Peter and Clarissa, and that is a love of life, a love of being alive. Um, and, and again here at the end of this uh, paragraph, and so on into the flare and glare. So you have the ellipsis and also the internal rhyme there. Okay, um, so here we are pushing uh, through. This is Peter now on the street. He is uh, making his way to uh, Clarissa's party, asking uh, the, the question here at the top, was everybody dining out then? Again, um, rhetorical question, one that can't be answered. And, and again, it's, it's Anthropophora because it's this sort of question that like earlier when Elizabeth was, was saying, what time was it, where is a clock? It's as though you are addressing someone else uh, looking for an answer that is obviously not forthcoming because there's no one there to ask. So um, here we go at the bottom of the page then uh, as he's making these observations of who's around. The cold stream of visual impressions failed him now as if the eye were a cup that overflowed and let the rest run down its china walls unrecorded. Uh, it's a really lovely um, example of uh, synesthesia. Okay, so synesthesia, of course, is when one image is described using uh, adjectives, uh, terms that are normally associated with another sense impression. So here it's to make more immediate uh, that sense impression, uh, impression that Peter is having. So then at the bottom of the page, the body must contract now, entering the house, the lighted house, where the door stood open, where the motor cars were standing. Uh, so that elaborative diacopy is, uh, it mirrors the exactness of, uh, of someone's observation. Uh, you see something initially and, uh, and you respond to it in, a, in an instant. And then as it starts to come into focus in your mind, uh, you add in details that help to, um, help to ground what it is that you're observing. Okay, so then of course here at the end of, uh, as he's thinking about um, going into the party. Peter, he opened the big blade of his pocket knife. So, so that the pocket knife's knife has made an appearance because Peter's going to enter an environment that is both tantalizing and terrifying for him. You know, he there's just no chance that he was going to stay home and read a book, right? Uh, I mean, he's drawn uh, almost um, instinctively against his will, like a moth to a, to a flame or something, uh, two parties like this. Okay, let's see. Um, so here, uh, there's a nice description of the... Um, uh, of the cook uh, or housekeeper, Mrs. Walker. I think it's it's probably the cook, Mrs. Walker. Um, among the plates, saucepans, colanders, frying pans, chicken and aspic, ice cream freezers, paired crusts of bread, lemons, soup tureens, and pudding basins, which, however hard they wash up in the scullery, seem to be all on top of her on the kitchen table on chairs while the fire blared and roared the electric lights glared and still supper had to be laid. Just a great uh, description there. And so uh, embedded in, in sort of the texture of this, you've got the, uh, the onomatopoeia of blared and roared. You got the, um, uh, the internal rhyme of blared and glared. And then this sense of uh, the hyperbolic sense of, of everything, all the dishes and whatnot, uh, the, the elements of the dinner part of the dinner party being on top of her, uh, that is Mrs. Walker. Okay, so the ladies are going upstairs already, so this means that they are, um, we, we remember from Pride and Prejudice, when after dinner, uh, the men went to the drawing room, the withdrawing room, and, um, and they would have their man talk and smoke cigars and cuss and whatever, uh, while the women uh, waited for them to, uh, to appear. And so the idea of the ladies going upstairs already uh, means that they're going into the, uh, the part of the Dalloway house where uh, the main party is going to, uh, to be located so people will have drinks and they will be 
you know, chit-chatting and, uh, and moving about. Okay. Let's see. Okay, so we've got uh, some positive uh, feedback on Mrs. Walker's cookery. Um, was it really made at home? Uh, but Miss Walker, of course, it seems like all the people in the story are, are just, um, and, and I think maybe this is part of what Wolf is suggesting about human nature in general, that uh, despite the fact that, that, the, that the people who are visitors, uh, guests of the party and so forth, are, are waxing so complimentary of Mrs. Walker's cookery, um, yet she is finding some little you know, problem with it or, or what have you. Um, but it was the salmon that bothered Mrs. Walker as she spun the plates round and round their simple diocopy and pulled in dampers and pulled out dampers, and there came a burst of laughter from the dining room, a voice speaking, then another burst of laughter. So burst uh, being something like uh, onomatopoeia. Okay, um, and here's a nice passage. The gentlemen enjoying themselves when the ladies had gone. You know, because guy talk, right? The toke, said Lucy, running in. Mr. Dalloway had sent for the toke from the emperor's cellars, the imperial toke. Um, so this is a, a great example of extended diacopy. And just so you know, toke is a, is a sweet wine. Uh, it's an expensive wine that is um, is from the uh, the toke, it's spelled T-O-K-A-J, region in Hungary. And so the extended diacopy then emphasizes uh, this wine and, uh, and what it means that the Dalloways have served it. Okay, it just says something about, um, you know, about the host uh, and hostess as, you know, fine art um, says about the tastes of, um, of someone who owns a home or, or something of that nature. Okay, and so as we start to, to push into the, to the main uh, part of the party and the description of of the rooms and who's coming in and um, and so forth and, and, and all the, the the little conversations that are happening you're going to see longer sentences you're going to see sentences that are are using uh, Zugma in its various forms um, in order to you know things like uh, both polysyndeton and asyndeton um, these long lists of things that are that are separated just by by commas to to suggest a speeding up an interminable sense of things, because what Wolf is trying to do then, of course, is use the way that she's writing about the party to reflect the dynamic nature of the party itself. Okay. Let's see. So my, I think my note here at the bottom is um, um, it is worth noting this. Um, which is probably a 150 word sentence uh, it's long and breathless um, again to to evoke a sense of, of a lot of information sort of spilling out of one all at once okay let's see um, oh so mr. Wilkins is um, is a man who has been hired uh, by the Dalloways to announce people as they come into the party and he would be standing there at the door uh, there is a, also a lady that is um, um, that is with Mr. Wilkins, who is sort of whispering the uh, the names of the people that have come in uh, to him, and then he makes this this sort of uh, loud pronouncement of you know who it is, and so uh, so we're going to see this punctuated throughout the next, I mean all the way to the end of the, so we're at 167 here, and and. Uh, until the end of the novel, the party is is going to be going on, okay? And so you'll you'll hear Wilkins' uh, announcement of people that are coming in uh, periodically, okay? Let's see. So the um, uh, the the epimony here uh, stresses the arch formality of Mr. Wilkins as he bent and straightened himself, bent and straightened himself, and announced with perfect impartiality, Lady and Miss Lovejoy. Sir John and Lady Needham, Miss Weld, Mr. Walsh, and so here's how Wolf has has given us the, the the indication that Peter Walsh has has made an appearance at the party, and thus begins the uh, the nice contrast between the mind of Peter and the mind of uh, Clarissa. How delightful!
You said clear, so she said it to of Peter as he is judging her, uh, as he is wont to do. Um, he should have stayed at home and read his book, thought Peter Wall, should have gone to a music hall. He should have stayed at home, for he knew no one. So the extended diagraphy reveals Peter's self-reproach and also his fears um, about um, about being at this, um, at what what is arguably, I mean, an important event in um, in London and not knowing anyone and not being known uh, by anyone, okay? Um, awesome use of polyptaton here at the end um, and the extended metaphor to, to suggest um, just the sort of fractured uh, state of, of Clarissa's mind and she's um, just worried that this, this is not gonna go well and all this kind of business. And so she could see Peter out of the tail of her eye, criticizing her there in that corner. Why, after all, did she do these things? Why seek pinnacles and stand drenched in fire? Might it consume her anyhow, burn her to cinders? And this is going to continue on to the next page. And this extended metaphor to accentuate Clarissa's uh, feeling of like being in hell. Um, and so, uh, of course, there's a, that's a great uh, example of irony there. I mean, she chose the, she says she does these parties for life. And yet at the same time, um, she is, um, you know, exhilarated by the thought of them and terrified by the thought of them. Okay, so um, it was extraordinary how Peter put her into these states just by coming and standing in a corner. Of course, it's not Peter's fault. Um, he made her see herself exaggerate. It was idiotic. But why did he come then merely to criticize? Why always take, never give? Uh, so this is the counterpoint to Peter's fears uh, that were revealed uh, just a paragraph before. Uh, that both of them are prisoners of their minds. I mean, they're tortured by fears. Um, and and they're, they are related to insignificant things. And they're related to things that they can't possibly know. Um, that what, like, I mean, because we know. Okay, so this is an example of dramatic irony. We know that Peter wasn't sitting at his hotel saying, yeah, I'm going to go to the party so that I can really uh, bleep with Clarissa and make her feel insignificant. It's nothing like that. Uh, and it's so often we are uh, are prone to to being paranoid about, about certain things, paranoid about the elements that uh, relate to our own personal weakness. Okay, let's see. Um, so I'm going to kind of gloss through um, uh, through this business. Uh, old, old Ellie, Ellie Henderson... Um, she's the old cousin of Clarissa's that you'll remember at the very beginning of the novel. Uh, there was this conversation about, um, you know, Clarissa didn't want to invite the old lady because she's just going to stand there, you know. Um, and, and yet we see that Ellie Henderson, uh, who's a little bit miffed at having been sort of invited at the last minute, she is there in, in a way that, I mean, you should be a little bit touched by this, okay? Especially if you have um, older females in your life, uh, you know, grandma, uh, you know, uh, Aunt Ethel, you know, great Aunt Ethel or, or whomever. I had a great Aunt Hilda myself. Um, that she is going to, to, like a sponge, absorb everything that's happened that night. And she's going to go home and she is going to tell, um, tell her friend, um, her friend Edith, uh, everything that happened. Okay. And so they're, they're probably going to milk this, uh, this event for weeks, uh, as they exchange things because, uh, you know, old lady Henderson, Ellie's going to forget stuff. And then, uh, the next day she'll say, Oh, Edith, I forgot to tell you about this. You know, so they'll be able to milk that thing for, for whatever it's worth. And it's also the reason why you should, um, you know, go visit your old relatives or call them on the phone because, you know, they just don't have that much uh, going on in their lives. Nobody wants to go visit old people. So give them something to talk about. Okay, uh, let's see. A nice, nice piece down here at the bottom where um, uh, Ellie Henderson sees uh, Richard Dalloway and he feels sorry for her, so he goes over to talk to her. Well, Ellie, and how's the world treating you? He said in his genial way, and Ellie Henderson getting nervous and flushing and feeling that it was extraordinarily nice of him to come and talk to her so that many people really felt the heat more than the cold. <laughs> so, right. I mean, 
it's like the old lady what he's he's trying to it's the kind of thing where you ask somebody how you doing and then you know the old person actually tells you and you're like going holy smokes that was just polite talk that i was trying to make and here you are giving me the history of your life um and so uh yes they do said richard dalloway yes but what more did one say exactly? Okay, so he gets saved by Peter Walsh, of course, who comes in and takes him by the arm, and so Ellie sees him walk off and um, and so forth. Um, here's, um, here we're back in the mind of Clarissa here at the bottom. Um, and yet for her own part, it was too much of an effort. She was not enjoying it. It was too much like being just anybody standing there. Anybody could do it. Yet this anybody she did a little admire couldn't help feeling that she had anyhow made this happen, that it marked a stage, this post that she felt herself to have become. For oddly enough, she had quite forgotten what she looked like, but felt herself a stake driven in at the top of her stairs. Every time she gave a party, she had this feeling of being something not herself, and that everyone was unreal in one way, much more real in another this that's called antithesis great uh, example of of showing that the two states of mind that um, uh, that Clarissa has it was she thought partly their clothes partly being taken out of their ordinary ways partly the background it was possible to say things you couldn't say anyhow else things that needed an effort possible to go much deeper but not for her not yet anyhow it's probably going to take the um uh, the party to thin out a little bit so she can feel relaxed when the sort of the frenetic nature of the early part of the party is passed so that anaphora is uh, is just a nice uh, it's it's her observation but it's also wolf using the sense of uh, what these parties mean to various people okay so let's see here oh and look here's sally seaton how awfully good of you to come, she said, and she meant it. It was odd how standing there one felt them going on, going on, some quite old, some. What name? So this is Wilkins who's just said it, and she just caught it. Lady Rossiter? But who on earth was Lady Rossiter? Clarissa, that voice, it was Sally Seton. Sally Seton, after all these years, so they got the epimony. She loomed through a mist, for she hadn't looked like that. Sally Seaton, when Clarissa grasped the hot water can to think of her under this roof, under this roof, not like that. So the name uh, is Epimony, and then it becomes extended diacopy, okay? And then the under this roof, under this roof again is... Um, and so we, we, as readers, get that reflexivity of going back um, to... Um, to Clarissa's earlier flashback about what what it was like to feel this uh, this strong emotional pull for Sally when she was a girl, and so I'm probably going to ask you this uh, this question: Who has five enormous boys? And, and so this is Clarissa's reflection. She had the simplest egotism, the most open desire to be thought first always, and Clarissa loved her for still being. Uh, for being still like that. I can't believe it, she cried, kindling all over with pleasure at the thought of the past. So kindling all over, uh, so we again have that, that sense of, of emotions being uh, linked to, uh, to fire. And it's what actually happens in the body um, when, when you're in a heightened state of excitement. You know, your temperature rises, uh, your, your skin flushes, and, and all this sort of thing. Okay. And then here we have, uh, but alas, Wilkins, Wilkins wanted her. Wilkins was emitting in a voice of commanding authority as if the whole company must be admonished and the hostess reclaimed from frivolity one name. The Prime Minister, said Peter Walsh. The Prime Minister, was it really? Ellie Henderson marveled. What a thing to tell Edith. So if I ask you a question about what famous person uh, makes an appearance at the party, of course you're going to know it's the Prime Minister. But here the uh, Wilkins, Wilkins, Wilkins. Um, and so we're thinking of that as, as extended, um, extended diacopy. Uh, it's, it's epizuxis here at the beginning, but then it becomes something else as it, as it transforms. And um, so, so again, this is uh, as, as Clarissa, we're in the state of Clarissa's mind where she's hearing um, somebody being announced and, and she's trying to place uh, all this, put it into context, okay? Um, 
and of course I've marked where there's a typo in the text. There's been a bunch of typos in the text here. All right, so um, so we're now here at the end of the reading, and uh, and so the prime minister has made an appearance, and we're going to get to see. Um, and, and we already th this paragraph is nice because he's just an ordinary dude, and even though he has the uh, the title of prime minister, uh, Wolf makes the point, in, you know, uh, indirectly. That he's just another guy, uh, and they are all all of them at this party. They're just, you know, they're representative of of the sea of humanity. All right, so hope you enjoyed that, and uh, I'll see you next time.